So I invite you as I read this text from um, 1 John 5 to take note of the emphasis on testimony. You might want to count uh, how many times that appears in this very brief text, just five verses, chapter 5, verses uh, 9 through 13. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he testified to his son. Those who believe in the son of God have testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given his son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life and this life is his son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Did you keep count? Seven. Yeah. Um, so how do you judge a person's testimony? I mean, how do you tell when a person is telling the truth or when they are lying? That's in the news a lot these days. Can you tell just by looking them in the eye or by the sound of their voice, the firmness of their handshake, right? Do their facial expressions give them away? Ronald Reagan coined the great phrase in the midst of negotiating arms reduction with the Russians, trust but verify, remember? Um, not many other than the current president who trusts the Russians, but that's another story. I have found that to be a very useful concept when responding if Reagan was a disciple, yep, yep. Um, so we can claim that, along with uh, LBJ. Um, so when people come requesting assistance, um, I find trust but verify very useful. I had a gentleman once who came into the office uh, because his family was stranded on the freeway, his car was out of gas, they just needed $25 to get home. And I said, great. I said, uh, I'll go grab a gas can, we'll go get some gas, and I'll take you out to your car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, all of a sudden, right, the story began to change, and uh, he didn't want to trouble me that much. Um, and after a few more questions, it soon became obvious he had neither a car nor a family. But most of the requests we receive in the office are quite genuine, like the 71-year-old woman in my office this week in tears because on her Social Security income, she could not find a place to live, and she was just asking for a place to park her car after finding out that the wait list, the wait time in St. Vinny's car camping program was six months. Um, and that was just uh, one of three that I received in the hour I was in the office on Thursday. Campaign season will soon be upon us again when we will be asked to trust the testimony of, of uh, politicians, right? I was pleased recently to give a tour um, of the tiny homes at Emerald Village to Newt Bueller. Found him to be very personable, personable as I also found myself in his tweet. Um, he seemed to be genuinely concerned about the issues of homelessness, which I think was confirmed in the position he outlined this past week with some proposals of what he would do if elected governor. I was disappointed he didn't mention our tiny homes in that, but nevertheless, uh, he's putting great attention on the issue. Uh, governor Brown has uh, likewise been a strong advocate on the issue um, and has even contributed personally to Emeraldville. I should have pointed that out to him while he was here. Did you know, Governor? <laughs> How much would you like to give? Um, so I'm hopeful, regardless of whoever is elected, that this will be a very significant primary uh, focus issue for our state this year, regardless of who wins. And politicians are not the only ones who are trying to win us over with their testimonies. Companies use testimonies of athletes and movie stars, entertainers of all kinds to sell their products. Uh, if uh, Matthew McConaughey says Christian Dior is the best designer of clothes, I might believe him because it makes him look so good, right? Of course, Matthew McConaughey could shop at Walmart and he would still look good. Um, but why should I believe him that Buick makes better cars as if being an actor makes one an expert on cars? Obviously, Buick thinks that we'll trust the testimony of Matthew McConaughey, that'll make us look good. 
Uh, I've served on a jury just once in my life. Um, most lawyers know that ministers don't make good jurists, right? <laughs> Uh, either they think that we're soft on crime, we're too forgiving, right? Or, or that we won't be impressed by their great rhetorical skills. Um, whatever the case, uh, uh, we tend to get kicked off by one side or the other. But this was a medical malpractice case and neither side found a reason not to like me, so I was given the wonderful opportunity to do my civic duty. The plaintiff was a woman who had carpal tunnel surgery that left her hand partially paralyzed. And so she was suing the surgeon for malpractice. For two days, we heard all kinds of expert testimony, including from uh, the woman herself, as she displayed her paralysis. Then on the third day, the defense attorney for the insurance company called in a doctor from Portland. Now, I don't know if he was wearing a suit from Christian Dior, but he looked as good as Matthew McConaughey, right? And, and, and very confident, not arrogant, uh, but um, clear, precise. And oh, by the way, he was the team physician for the Portland Trailblazers, a fact that the defense attorney made sure we all knew. Um, I don't know what that has to do with carpal tunnel, <laughs> right, surgery. Maybe basketball players have that problem, you know, from, from dribbling. But in any case, uh, 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 when he was finished, you could tell from the faces of the plaintiff as well as her attorney that they were finished too, right? There was no malpractice. It was simply an accepted risk of the sur surgery of which she was well informed. And no doubt the insurance company paid handsomely for this handsome expert and he was worth every cent. He blew the case right out of the proverbial waters. The next day when we arrived uh, at the courtroom, the judge called us in and informed us the case had been dismissed, um, uh, that uh, the suit had been settled out of court. We soon discovered the plaintiff accepted a small offer from the insurance company that was much smaller than the one she was offered before the trial began. Um, so concerned were they they were gonna lose the case. If you find human testimony credible, says John, then you must find God's testimony even more credible. Why? Because the life of Jesus says it all. This 19-year-old homily, 1 John, opens with these words. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Jesus is God's testimony of life to us. And as we saw in the text we looked at last week, in Christ we find the means to conquer the way of the world, the way of death with the way of love and life. Therefore, it is in Jesus that we find that way of life that is eternal. And so the author concludes those who have Jesus have that life in God. And there are countless ways that we can affirm that to be a case. People whose lives have been changed as a result of their encounter with the risen Christ. Those who find life here in the community, in the body of Christ. People who have found healing in Christ even when they have not found a cure. Victims of injustices, discrimination, harassment who find in the church acceptance and equality. There are many ways that Jesus conquers the way of death and gives us new life. But what about those who do not believe in Jesus, who are not a part of the body of Christ? And the author of 1 John sees only one possibility. They are excluded, condemned, doomed. They don't have this life in God. If you've got Jesus, you've got life, and if you don't, yeah, too bad. It's that simple, right? Is it? Really? I mean, maybe that made sense in the context of the late first, first century, when the primary options outside of Jewish Palestine was a polyglot of mythologies headed by the Roman emperor, bent on making the world bow to his will and power and using religion for that purpose. But does that still make sense today? How do you preach on a text like this if you are a pro progressive Christian like me who believes that God's love is greater than our hate, than our prejudice, than our limitations and exclusions. As Paul says in Romans 8, that nothing can separate us, any of us, from the love of God in Christ Jesus. 
Retired Episcopalian Bishop John Shelby Spong has, I believe, the best answer of anyone I know for this. And Spong has been, as many of you know, quite controversial on a number of topics. He may be a heretic for denying things like the virgin birth or the physical resurrection of Jesus, suggesting even that Jesus might have been married to Mary Magdalene. Seems pretty radical, right? But you don't have to agree with Spong on any of that. Um, in order to agree with the most important things that he says. Same's true for use truly, right? Someone even asked me last week, you know, is it still okay if I don't agree with everything you say in your sermons, right? And I said, yes, it's still okay. <laughs> that is, of course, assuming you still agree with me about the ducks, right? You know, <laughs> things that are really important. Duck fan or not, Spong is one of those prophetic voices who needs to be heard in the church today, especially when it concerns the future of the church to which he has devoted his life. So he was here in Eugene in 2006 when I had the opportunity to meet him over dinner and found him to be just as delightful and genuine in person as he was on the stage. And I think there were about 25 of us or so who went to hear him. How many here were there that night, went to hear him speak on campus at the university? Man, we can't have lost you all since then. And there were a few there. Another story, yeah. Uh, at any rate, um, it was a packed uh, hall um, there on the Oregon campus, and his lecture was on the nature of God in the 21st century. He began by listing a long litany of sins of Christianity, the Crusades, the support of slavery, anti-Semitism leading to the Holocaust, sexism, the oppression of women, homophobia, the persecution of anyone who is not a, a heterosexual, and so forth. And add to that now the sexual abuse among clergy. And of course, the Pennsylvania grand jury is all over the news and on our minds this week. Uh, but the recent revelation of the Willow Creek uh, church in Minnesota, one of the largest Protestant mega churches in the country, and um, uh, their pastor should remind us that it is not just a problem uh, in the Catholic Church. Uh, and to that, then, he added a long list of the sins of Scripture on which he has written a book by the same title. I invite you, if you haven't read it, check it out. Things like the murder of all the firstborn male children of Egypt in the Exodus story. The day the sun stood still in the book of Joshua, which of course we know now means the earth had to cease turning, which is simply nonsensical. But the purpose of that galactic absurdity was not to wow earthlings with God's power, it was to allow Joshua the time he needed to annihilate all the men, women, and children of the Amorites. Today we would call that genocide. It's there in our scripture. Noah's flood, right, that drowned all living things other than those living in the sea that, and were, that were not on Noah's boat. And then there is that very abysmal story of Lot, and we forget this part of the story, who offers his two daughters to the men of Sodom to do with whatever they pleased. And if that were not enough, for good measure, Spong added a long list sins of the so-called Bible Belt, including things like states with the highest rate of abortion, states with the highest rate of divorce, states with the highest rate of poverty, the, uh, the most uh, numbers of lynchings of African Americans in the Bible Belt, uh, and then of course the states which went to the greatest lengths to defend segregation. At this point in the lecture, right, hearing all these things, I begin to wonder, is he going to say anything good for our Christian faith? And he did. Uh, he spoke of his love for God and for the Bible that he learned as a child, which would later help him to overcome all of those shortcomings of our tradition. But the main point of his lecture was that all of those sins of our past, our present, and the text come from a false image of God as a tribal God. The idea that God is our God and not someone else's God. That God is on our side and not on their side. That a God who has chosen us and ignored, forgotten, rejected all other peoples and nations. And any religion, Spong said, which follows a God who thus dehumanizes others, cannot be a true religion or have a true God.
God, and therefore we must reject such notions. And yes, there are many stories in scripture which would seem to promote such a false view of a tribal God. And maybe there was a time when such a viewpoint was essential for the faith and the people to survive, but now the reverse is true. The image of a tribal God who is for us and against our enemy is especially dangerous in this nuclear age and is contrary to the advancement of humanity in the 21st century. Fortunately, scripture also gives us plenty of stories to support such an inclusive, broad view of God, a God who does love all of humanity, all creation, not just those who believe in him, a God who is on everyone's side, a God who says of that one caught in adultery, whoever is without sin may cast the first stone, a God who welcomes the outcasts, who welcomes the sinners to the banquet table of life, a God who, when immigrants were despised and unwelcomed in Israel, made an immigrant woman by the name of Ruth the grandmother of King David. The tribal God, says Spong, was the God of our religious adolescence. And if Christianity is to mature, to offer true good news for the 21st century, it must abandon that God for a more inclusive God who does not judge us based on our race, our national origin, our immigration status, our sexual identity, our physical ability, or even our religious preference. What God cares about is our full humanity, that we may be fully alive to who we are, all of us created in the image of God, created to love as God loves. And this, you see, is precisely what G Jesus reveals to us, that testimony to that life in God, that love that died for us, yet still as sinners. So it's not a question of who has Jesus and who does not, but who has found that fullness of life in God and who has not yet found it. And so our task as followers of Jesus is to help others find this fullness of life just as we have found it in Christ, to bring others to the banquet table of God where all are included, welcomed, and blessed. Is this a message needed for our time? At that lecture with over 500 people present, Spong received not one, but two very long standing ovations. We are the ones who are now called in this generation to witness to this life in God. Will others find our testimony credible? That all depends, doesn't it? on how well we live our life and witness to the life of God. The testimony of Christ is clear. The rest is left to us. We invite any who wish to be a part of a community that seeks to give witness, such witness, to that fullness of life in God as we have experienced in and. Uh, in Christ, who would like to join with us to be a part of this congregation, to make that witness, that testimony, that confession of faith, be that by confession, be that by transfer of membership, renewal of your faith, who would like to do so may do so this morning as we sing our hymn of discipleship, help us accept each other. I invite all who are able to stand with us and to sing. <laughs> 